Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Doug Guthrie, Dean of the George Washington University School of Business. Good evening. Uh, one of the wonderful honors that uh, I have as being the Dean of the George Washington School of Business um, is being a part of bringing together people from the university community, uh, from the community at large, uh, from the business world, all in the nation's capital to talk about important issues that are shaping our economic, political, and global future. The Maxson Lecture Series is one of the great opportunities that we have to do this in a very special way. Once a year, we come together uh, to bring people uh, that have had significant influence in both business and political realms um, over the course of their careers to really impact in a very deep way where our nation is headed. A year ago, I was sitting on this stage with Wes Bush, the chairman and CEO of uh, North Grumman. Two years ago, it was Ian Cook of Colgate. And it's a lot of fun just to be a part of that, that engagement and that moment. Uh, we get to hear what these business leaders are thinking. Uh, and we also get to sit down and talk with them face-to-face uh, -face in somewhat of an interview, interview format uh, just to really plumb the depths of how they think about business and how they think about create, creative leadership in this current economic moment. Um, tonight, it's my special honor. Um, to, to be hosting an event that not only brings uh, a double alum um, and somebody who has been a part of the Washington community uh, since he was a, a student here at, at, at GW, but also somebody who is actually, in my opinion, one of the most creative business leaders that I have ever encountered uh, in my many years as a professor and, and more recently as a dean. Uh, and so it's just so exciting to, to be a part of this and to bring people together, uh, professors, students, people from the community, um, and to welcome you all here and to, to have a great evening of dialogue um, with a wonderful business leader who is changing the world through his work. So without further ado, in order to, uh, to, to introduce our, our guest, let me turn the stage over to uh, my friend and colleague, Provost Stephen Lerman. Well, thank you, Doug, and welcome to everybody. Thank you for being here this evening. It's uh, my pleasure and honor to actually be here for the uh, 14th annual Robert P. Maxson Lecture and the, the opportunity to introduce our speaker. Uh, first of all, I want to thank our speaker, uh, Hossein Fateh, for actually coming here, taking his time from his busy schedule, sharing what he knows and what he's learned uh, with us. Uh, these sort of events where we get to bring an outstanding individual uh, to the campus to talk with you, uh, students, faculty, and staff, really are a very important part of what we do and really part of the advantage of being in such a great metropolitan area like the Washington, D.C. area. The access we can provide to people uh, with the experience and expertise and uh, accomplishments such as our today's speaker really is just extraordinary. It's what makes it a delight to be part of this community. Um, for our students, it gives a chance for them to see how knowledge gets translated into action, in this case, in the business world. Uh, someone who takes things they learned here, adds to them their own life experiences, and then creates uh, value from those through his work uh, as a, in a company. Um, it's my great pleasure now to introduce him briefly and just give a just quick piece of his bio. Uh, Mr. Fateh was the co-founder of Dupont Fabros, which is, um, a technology company, actually the full name of the company is Dupont Fabros Technology, where he served as president, chief executive officer, and director since 2007. The company is a real estate trust, investment trust, and it's the leading owner and developer of wholesale data centers. Uh, data centers are really uh, the backbone of why internet services work. And most people are unaware of the importance they play, the scale of operations, uh, which was, uh, grows very rapidly. This is a, a line of business that is essential to delivering services over the internet. Uh, when we talk about computing in the cloud, uh, perhaps one's image is there's a cloud out there. Well, really what there are are data centers out there 
which constitute the cloud. These are real machines that require real space, uh, real resources, expertise to uh, create those spaces so that they run efficiently, uh, they run in an energy efficient way, uh, and they are integral to the growth of businesses around uh, the world. Um, quick anecdote and a bit of a diversion. Uh, my son is in a startup company uh, that actually now is somewhat larger than the startup. They are completely reliant on data centers such as the ones, and I have no idea where they happen to be in, ones operated by uh, Mr. Fateh's company, but they are completely dependent on them. They don't have their own data centers at all. Uh, and this is becoming increasingly typical. It, what it allows companies that are, don't want to be in the data center business, business but need to be in the service business to focus on what they're good at. And they're not particularly good at building out specialized real estate. It also allows businesses to exploit the economies of scale that are associated with building large data centers. Uh, we were just talking backstage and uh, Mr. Fateh was telling me how the extent of economies of scale in this business. Most small, small businesses cannot achieve those economies of scale in a data center on their own. But the sort of companies and sort of services that Mr. Fateh's companies provide allows them to grow uh, in their earlier stages. Uh, this company uh, was uh, co-founded uh, with Mr. Lamott J. DuPont in 1997. And prior to this, he was the vice president of a broad-based Washington, D.C. real estate development company. And his responsibilities there uh, include acquisition, financing, and sales. Uh, we're proud to say that Mr. Fateh is a double alumnus of the George Washington School of Business. He has a BBA degree from us and a master's in finance for us. Uh, and a brief side note, which is uh, somewhat irrelevant to his uh, actual presentation, while he was here, he was a rower in men's crew. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Hossein Fateh. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'd like to thank Dean Guthrie, Provost Lerman, and, and Elizabeth Mitchell for making this happen. As alumni, I'm very proud to be here today to tell you my story, to talk a little bit about real estate investment trusts and the future of the internet. The short story is I came to GW without a green card, and in very short years after that, I got a, uh, a degree from here, a master's, a green card, citizenship, a wife, three kids, and a $3 billion public company, all within a very short amount of years. <laughs> the long story is that I was lucky over, very lucky you know, over a period of time, and um, was lucky enough to make the right decisions over a uh, long career. Uh, after graduating from GW, I worked for a broad-based Washington, D.C. developer who, in the early 90s, had a lot of recourse debt. As he went through bankruptcy, I had um, uh, no other job to go to because they didn't have a green card. So I stuck with him and learned the bankruptcy process. My last project with them was a 440-unit apartment project with... Um, that I brought in Northwestern Mutual Life to finance the debt and equity in that project. Uh, you know, I managed to buy part of the promote in that project from him. So, uh, so after eight years, the project became one of the most successful apartment projects that Northwest had done. And I was managed to sell my, uh, my interest to Northwest with very little money I had put in and take out seven figures, low seven figures. With that money, I started my own company, DuPont Fabros Development. One of our first projects was a 115-acre um, piece of land in Ashburn, Virginia, across from the back then UUNET's campus, which is now Verizon's campus. Then I realized how connectivity was a very, going to be a very large part of the internet. And we, in a matter of a year, in September of 2000, we signed a lease with Exodus Communications for 650,000 square feet comprising of six buildings. Within a year of that happening, Exodus, 
who was at the time in the business of retail data centers. They rented essentially racks and provided services of power, cooling, security, and minimal amount of connectivity to those racks. And they really rented those one rack at a time, and they were getting license agreements that were uh, one or two year periods. Their returns were, were astronomical. They were getting 100% of their money back on invested capital within a year. Lo and behold, these companies expand, you know, expanded too rapidly. And as the internet bubble burst, it all went away. I was the landlord of one of the largest companies. And because of my bankruptcy experience, we had collected $14 million in deposits. But, you know, but as I toured our investments that we had gotten back, you know, I also realized that we had gotten back $55 million of data center infrastructure inside a $10 million shell. That infrastructure comprised of generators, UPS systems, switch gear down to a PDU, which is, which is essentially an a electric plug in the wall. On the other side, they had all the cooling, chillers, condensers that it takes to cool these data centers. This infrastructure, I realized is super valuable, but cannot be moved. At that point, I went to my business partner, Lamont DuPont, and told him, you know, Lamont, I think I figured out a legal way to steal. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, look, these companies are all going out, going out of business, and they're leaving behind millions of dollars of infrastructure. Well, you and I both know this, the internet is not going away. If anything, it's expanding very rapidly. So we put together a strategy of going around the country, buying the shelves from the landlords and paying the landlords full price for the shelves of the buildings. And we knew that the tenants were bankrupt, and we knew the tenants were going to leave and leave behind millions of dollars of infrastructure. And we went ahead and uh, uh, purchased the LA3 building of Exodus, the AboveNet building in Reston, Virginia. I think it was $123 million went into it. We purchased it for $23 million. Um, we went ahead and purchased the AOL building in Gainesville, and later on purchased all of the cable and wireless portfolio. Over time, we developed, we also bought in the personnel from various companies in how to run this. We also realized that, you know, as young guys who at the time in our uh, really early 30s, we did not have the capital to be able to own a large part, part of this. So we realized what we needed to do is to lower those rents that were paying back 100% a year to some portion of saying we thought, look, as a real estate guy, if you get a low teens on return on invested capital, that is an excellent type of return. But what we really wanted to do is to leverage the assets. How do you leverage the assets to borrow against these assets with banks with non-recourse debt? For those of you that are not real estate, uh, taking uh, your schooling in real estate, non-recourse means without your personal signature. So if it fails, you just give the keys to the bank. So we went ahead and looked at the lease structure, what we call triple net, which means all the operating costs are passed through to the tenants. And we gave the tenants a lower rent in the low teens on invested capital. All, you know, at the same time, we were lucky enough, and uh, my story has a lot of luck to do with it, that the search wars are going on with the internet. Yahoo, Microsoft, and Google were fighting for the number one place to become the search engine to the internet. We signed leases with all three of them. And we had long-term, seven years, 10 years, five-year leases, and leased up all these buildings with these tenants 
and were able to borrow essentially um, 90, sometimes 100% against the buildings with non-recourse debt. Some of our lenders were making um, very high returns, but we really didn't care because we knew the equity mattered most at the end. The last deal we did was super interesting. When cable and wireless was going bankrupt, I spent 48 hours in Blackstone's offices in New York. Uh, we had a team of eight lawyers with me, and I had spent nine months getting to that point and with my money and my partner's money, put in a million dollars of my own money and his money into just getting to that auction. At the time of the auction, the auction took place um, on uh, Park Avenue in New York, but we did not leave the building for 48 hours. On the round 45 hours, into it without sleeping, without changing, without brushing her teeth. You, uh, there were bidding going on. It was a very interesting scene, as all of you in business would, you know, I hope one day you know, get this opportunity. Carl Icahn was there, the Gores brothers was there, um, all the big hedge funds were there. One out of the other, we were bidding against each other. After about 40 hours, I ran out of money, and people were bidding against me. I thought I had lost a million dollars of my money and my partner's money. I was very upset sitting there with my head in my hands. It was a very uh, smart restructuring lawyer, Mark Shapiro at Lehman Brothers at the time, came to me and said, Hussein, you know, kind of had a New Yorker accent, you know, we've been there a long time. Why don't we just sit around here and see what kind of breadcrumbs we can find? I'm like, okay, well, I, haven't, I haven't, don't have anywhere to go right now. <laughs> and uh, so we sat there, and the two bidders that got ahead of them was Gores and Savas. Savas was also running out of money. They came to me and said, Hussein, would you buy all the real estate and lease it back to us? I realized, well, that doesn't sound like a bad plan, but I actually want to own, you know, I actually want to run it. They said, no, 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 we just want a triple net lease. I'm like, okay. I gave them a number, and for those of you in real estate will appreciate this, is a 19% cap rate. But I said, I'll have the money for you tomorrow. They signed the term sheet on a yellow piece of pad that you all take notes on, and within, um, and we bought $53 million of real estate. Within a year, we sold that to Digital Communications for $94 million. So at that time, we realized that, look, this is a real business that we could succeed in. Within a, um, at the time, we had gained a reputation. Microsoft, Yahoo, Google uh, were coming back to us and saying, would you please build us more data centers? And we said, well, yeah, sure, we can do it, but please sign a lease. And they said yes. And at every turn, we managed to finance 100% of our way into the data centers and we, got, and we paid ourselves enough leasing commissions so it would be our equity in the deals. So at every turn, we were turning millions of dollars of leasing commissions and uh, putting our money back into the deals. Also from a tax structure, we were using double declining balance on a um, five-year you know, accelerated depreciation. So we really had no taxes to pay because the assets were depreciating so fast. The, from a tax standpoint. Our, our last deal, we, it was a $400 million asset because I realized this was expanding so fast. How are we gonna get multi-tenant buildings? The only way to do it is to start building them larger and larger and larger. Our last asset uh, that I built prior to going public was 340,000 square feet um, it's the size of four football fields long, essentially. And when we did that asset, I realized that, that it was $400 million. I had three lenders on our first trust and two MES lenders and a $40 million of equity. I realized after that that there is no way you could continue building that with different segments 
in your financial structure. And by the way, every single one of my lenders in two years after we went public, you know, after we went public, went bankrupt. <laughs> they were Lehman Brothers, you know, I-Star, uh, Merrill Lynch Capital, and um, Fremont. So it was a good thing we did go public because every one of them went out of business, so, so our lending would have stopped. At the time, we put all our assets together and wanted to go public. We looked at the different classes of how to go public. And we looked at valuations, whether we should be a REIT or a C Corp. A C Corp, we soon realized we were going to be too big for a C Corp. You couldn't, at the time, take a $700 million float with a C Corp. It was just too large for an unknown technology name. But for a REIT with stable income stream, it was, not, you know, it was the largest IPO of the year, but it wasn't the largest that was done in the history of the uh, REIT world. So um, we decided that probably being a REIT is better. Also, we realized being a REIT, you could leverage it again, which being a, a C Corp and a technology company, you couldn't. We also wanted to have technology investors because there's something in the REIT world what is termed as the REIT mafia. There are only a few funds that are very large. The entire REIT world is about $500 million. Back then, it was about $400 billion. Sorry, $400 billion. Right now, it's about $544 billion. It was where a certain number of funds control that type of money. So we knew if we get two different types of investor class buying our shares, they would compete with each other and we would get the best price. That's why we call it DuPont Fabros Technology, because we wanted more technology investors to diversify from just the REIT ones. Then we hit a speed bump. This was in March of 2007. We realized that we went to go public. We did our audited financials. Before that, our financials were being run on QuickBooks, believe it or not. We went ahead. And our lawyers came back and said, we need a private letter ruling from the IRS to become a REIT. Um, we filed with the IRS. We got the right consultants. It took us six months. And we were the first of its kind to qualify the REIT structure as data centers. And we qualified data centers as a REIT so we could get a legal opinion uh, from our lawyers. And as soon as that happened, we went public on March 17th of 2007. Um, it was probably uh, one of the most expi you know, exciting days of my life that I hope that many of you in the business world are able to do. The restructure is extremely powerful tool that I believe is going to expand rapidly. Um, currently, uh, you know, Last year was about $400 billion, $450 billion. This year is about $540 billion. I believe in the next five years we'll have a trillion dollar industry. It is, and it's expanding through when we, prior to us, someone else had got a private letter ruling um, on cool storage REITs. We got the data center first private letter ruling. That structure is going to expand in our lifetime for new business opportunities. Does a company recently, um, Hannon Armstrong, who got a private letter ruling on what they do is build devices on top of buildings. They don't own any of the real estate that saves energy, and they take a percentage savings of the energy of the air conditioning of the heating of the building, and that comes to the entity. That was recently qualified as a private ad, you know, as a real estate investment trust. With the, all the REIT investors wanting fixed income streams, this is going to expand more and more. The general root REIT laws are that 90% of the taxable income has to be distributed to investors. With that, there is no double taxation. So where I would like to see the industry grow to, 
which I think would be very powerful and very exciting for you all, is, for example, I have a friend who owns a pharmaceutical company, the largest of its kind in Italy. They have an investment in New York. They buy patent rights of medical devices with income streams that generate like a dividend type income for years to come. There's no reason for that company that couldn't become a REIT because it's capital intensive and then it has a flow of income stream. If they were allowed to become a REIT, we as investors would be allowed to invest in them you know, as individuals where right now that is only open to large pharmaceuticals and hedge funds. So I'm hoping that the REIT industry is going to expand, and it looks like with the ups and downs of um, various administrations, you know, it's allowed to expand. Um, yeah, yeah, I met Sam Zell uh, one day on the beach in France. He told me the exact same thing, that the REIT industry is going to expand very rapidly. The, where I'd like to also go is talk a little bit about, after REITs, about the future of big data. Like I said, I think you all are in a very exciting place right now where data centers and data is going to expand. We are, in my belief, if the internet is a 10-chapter book, barely at chapter three. The various things that have happened, search, revolutionized in your lifetime the advertising industry. The distribution of music has been revolutionized. The distribution of movies in the last four years has been revolutionized. These industries are changing because of the power of the internet. I was speaking to Dean Provost you know, in the back room. He just told me, look, in a few years he expects your refrigerator to, to, to have an IP address. <laughs> I, I believe that everything in your house will have an IP address. And this will revolutionize the way we live. Medical histories, me, uh, your information on medicine, if it was digitized, it will cut down the cost of medical care. Of course, they have to get through all the privacy issues. But these are things that it's really happening in our lifetime in there has never been such fast, expeditious change in, in the last 40 or 50 years that really changes the way we live and we do business. And it's our opportunity to really take advantage of this. The next thing that's coming and we see very clearly is handhelds and what you hold all have in your pocket, your phones, your iPad, your iPods, that is really also changing the way we live. All that data is gonna be stored in a data center, and that is expanding very rapidly. And people tell me, look, the, but computers are getting smaller. Of course computers are getting smaller, but that's really not the issue. Moore's law, which defined how computers use power and what they do, started to, uh, about 25 years ago, Gordon Moore from Intel set a rule that chips will do double what they did 18 months ago. That's still in place. Your laptop will do double in 18 months than it did 18 months ago. And so, sorry, it'll double twice by that time. So in three, in three years, essentially, it will double twice. So what, it, that, what this means is, and it'll use maybe 20% more power. So what this really means is, last year, we leased 41 megawatts of critical load, which was the largest amount of leasing we've done in our history. So what this really means is if Moore's law is growing at double every 18 months, it really means that the demand that we as a society are putting on our servers 
is growing way faster than double every 18 months. And it's because as a society, we're gonna need more companies like a Dropbox. I had investor meetings all day yesterday. This is exactly what we were talking about. Why is Dropbox expanding so rapidly? It's because we as a society are keep using outsourced solutions to store our data. The photographs we're taking are using more megapixels. The files we have are bigger. We store more emails. We receive more information. And that's growing faster than Moore's law. And that's what is very exciting, not only in my business, but what's happening in the society. It's for you guys to really take advantage of it. And I have seen new business models that many of you are going to be involved in that is going on to the cloud. The cloud right now is really, as far as shared cloud, two very large companies. It's really ASW, which is Amazon Web Services, and Rackspace. Rackspace is about half a billion of sales a year. Amazon is about a billion a year. But now we're going to see in the next couple of years smaller web-based services like the salesforce.com, like the, um, that do one specialized niche cloud solution, and that's gonna be hosted specially on and written on a software, and I don't think necessarily they're gonna be owned by some of the major companies, because people are scared. Cloud is also not that movable. It is not that if you build your operating system on an Amazon cloud, eventually it will be tough for you to move it to something else. Rackspace has OpenStack, which is a little bit easier to move. So we will have separate companies developing cloud solutions that deal with specific topics like compliance and banking. And those will be outsourced to people like me. And I see that as a very, very rapidly growing field. I think that we live in a very exciting time right now for you guys. The, the time that we live today is where huge business opportunities are going to occur. And that for the first time, to kind of wrap up the session, we have, as a country, have almost free energy. We have natural gas coming at three and a half dollars a BTU, which is unheard of. For those of you who don't know, in Singapore, natural gas costs $18 a BTU. That means almost free energy. At the same time, within the next five years, we'll have independence on oil, and we will be able to live independent to any other country. At the same time that this is happening on the energy side, we have the internet and technology that is exploding. So um, I think it's a very exciting time for you guys to be graduating from GW. And um, somehow, you know, I've had a very exciting career, but I would give it all back if I could go right back and do it again with you guys. Thank you. So um, thank you so much for that. It's, um, uh, as I said in my opening comments, it's so exciting for me to, to be on stage and to share the stage with business leaders who I think are creating the world in, in ways that I can only imagine. Um, and, and I meant what I said when I was uh, introducing you, and that every time I hear you talk, I just feel like the sense of the, the, the creativity and, and the uh, the energy towards really envisioning a new future. Uh, but, but before I get into that, uh, I actually do have to ask the question. Uh, I, I kind of joked with you about it backstage, but we, we need to know, are, are you the guy that owns the internet? No, I'm the landlord <laughs> to the internet. <laughs> I don't own it. <laughs> I mean, it's, oh, it's fascinating to think to me because before I started talking to you, I never 
it never occurred to me, but like this all sits somewhere and people own the buildings and there's an, a, a massive a, a kind of project that goes on around that. Oh, yeah. All these services sit somewhere, <laughs> they're very expensive and they get turned every year. But what's exciting, what we do is not necessarily the technology part of it. What we do is we provide power, cooling, and security to the internet. The technology part of it is done by tenants. And that's the server technology that's improving by doubling every 18 months. So you provide the infrastructure. But as I understand it, that infrastructure has a lot to do with the balance between things like the power grid. And you were talking about how cheap energy is becoming. But it also has to do with tax policy and kind of very complex things that happen in what we might think of as the political economy at the state level. Can you talk a little bit about what that? Sure, in typical real estate, and if any of you guys from real estate, the uh, um, formula is location, location, location. In data centers, we look at location, we look at cost of power, we look at availability of fiber optic networks, and lastly, we look at taxes that the tenants pay and the taxes that we have to pay to optimize. And what we look at is to optimizing that, it's not really two-dimensional, it's not three or four-dimensional, is optimizing all those things, and that's the selection we make as to where to build these buildings that are essentially 300, 400 million dollars each. But when you were building that infrastructure in, in Northern Virginia, for example, were you thinking about all of those issues? Because it sounds oh, yeah, like absolutely. you Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And you know, what we also realized is we devised a model that at first anyone in real estate starts to think about is what is your cost per square foot a year? What do you charge for rent per square foot? Then we soon realized that square foot is an irrelevant way of thinking about it. We need to think about our cost per available kilowatt. Because it doesn't matter if the servers are on top of each other four high or eight high or they take up how many. What matters is each rack of servers is how many kilowatts of energy does it use as long as you promise to cool it. So soon after that, we realized the price per kilowatt is irrelevant. And what we need to price is, sorry, price per square foot is irrelevant. We need to price our rents per available kilowatt per month. Then we look at our operating expenses per available kilowatt. And guess what? My construction costs, I also think about as per available megawatt to the tenant. So it's just a different way of thinking about it. But that's how my customers would think about it, because at Google, they care about how many servers they plug in. They don't care about how much space I give them. So I mean, I think you're, you're very humble because you frame it as sort of a very simple way of thinking about things. But it kind of takes me to another thing that I, I wanted uh, to just ask you about. And this is mostly for, for the students in the room. Um, when we take, when we try to teach about creativity and innovation in business schools, you know, it often takes on this sort of ethereal sense of like there's some kind of magic that takes you to the world of art and it's usually about product innovation. But I'm always fascinated in the places that creativity exists in much more mundane parts of the world. So you take the real estate piece of the world and obviously part of your career was thinking very creatively about bankruptcy laws and opportunities there and buildings that were full of tenants and then of course there's the internet and what was possible there. Uh, and then there's just a piece of sort of seeing the future and kind of bringing industries together. Can you talk a little bit about what you're, sure. how you think about those issues? Yes. I think in uh, Psychology 101 here in GW, we all learned um, after you're not hungry and um, you have shelter and you know, all the other needs that pe people need, then after that you start thinking about how can I be creative? That's what really matters. And I think there are tremendous opportunities in business to be creative, to optimize, to th start thinking of ways to optimize um, your business model. And it's hugely satisfactory when you come up with those solutions. 
but I'll give you like two or three examples of things that we have thought about. You know, other than data centers, we thought about, well, you know, if we can take an operating business and start looking at it as a real estate model and to then be able to create more value from a real estate angle than from an operating business, what else can we do that with? We looked at gas stations. A gas station typically trades for about three or four times net income. So you have a gas station that's got $200,000 of income. It's worth $600,000 or so. And now, why not put a lease on that gas station at a $100,000 lease? And then you pay an operator uh, to run it for $100,000. Something with a lease on it is worth a 10% cap rate. That's worth a million dollars. We took this idea to Wall Street, and we looked at it, and we uh, Getty Oil, we tried to buy 115 gas station to implement it. They, didn't, they ended up doing it themselves. But it really did make sense. You know, another idea, we looked at the FBOs, for those of you who may not know. An FBO is a fixed base operator of private aircraft. An FBO trades almost at the operating business level, and it's really a full-time gas station. Why not? and you have markup in gas that big corporations pay. And bigger users of aircraft may be using it, um, may be using their aircraft a lot, and they may have paying more in to the landlord in gas, uh, in upcharges in their gas bills than they would have uh, you know, otherwise. So we said, why not have your fixed based operator charge a premium rent, but then give away the gas at cost. Then you would fill your fixed based operators with tenants that use a lot, that fly a lot. You would give that away. Your building will have a rental income stream that would, could be trade at a higher cap rate. So I think. Uh, there are opportunities like this that come along. Like right now, I see this change that is going on in natural gas. We know that there are hundreds of thousands of people that are going to South Texas, Western Pennsylvania, and North Dakota. That's a fact. Those people need housing. They need to be fed. They need to be clothed. They need to have dry cleaning. They need to have laundry service. That is a fundamental change that is going on and is not going to stop for 20 years. So when I say it's an exciting time, I challenge you guys to look at that and to say, how can I find challenging solutions, creative solutions, and to optimize with technology those business models that you're doing to provide those services. Don't forget, Levi made his money providing pick, pickaxes, forks, and shovels to the gold miners. It wasn't the gold miners that made the most money. It was Levi Strauss. So, uh, I challenge you guys, and that's why I think it's an exciting time, because we have a fundamental change going on in this country. You don't need to travel to Asia that you guys could take advantage of and to find creative solutions. In, in that sense, creativity then is really about just seeing opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing it's, opportunity and then optimizing it. I think right. it's a, you want to be creative, you want to see the opportunity, and to um, have conviction uh, and grab luck when it walks by. <laughs> so you mentioned luck, luck before, uh, although it seems to me, I mean, it, 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 again, it's uh, generous of you to, to frame it that way, but, and luck may be one piece of it, but there is this interesting interplay between luck, creativity, but then also leadership. I mean, ultimately, you had to build an organization. And, and 
I was also interested when you were talking about the most exciting day having been the, the IPO day. Can you talk a little bit more about building that organization and what yeah. that meant from a leadership perspective? Frankly, the more and more uh, my business career goes forward, the more I realize that the building of the organization becomes much more significant. And you have to rely on other people, train other people, meet with your various managers. I've learned recently not to have too many people, try and have less people reporting to me directly, and to build an organization that you can rely on. Um, so doing that, I think I've learned a lot. I think in the beginning, I felt that I had tried to do everything myself, or at least wanting to control everything. But I think it's absolutely true. In every um, successful businessman has a big team around him that he needs to build over time trust, and he needs to understand. It doesn't mean that you have to listen to everything they said. The worst thing is, I think, uh, decision making by committee. But that leader needs to listen very carefully to all its lieutenants and understand where they're coming from and then make a decision. And the listening part, it becomes much more, it becomes more and more important. And then you also have, need to have a head of eye chart to actually recruit and build a team. Because you're paying people salaries, but you want to benefit and get more out of them than just a salary. Right. So I mean, as an, as an organizational scholar and somebody who taught leadership, it always makes my heart flutter a little bit to, to hear people who have who've done brilliant things in business talk about what really needs to be done is build good organizations. But let me take this to a, a, another area that I think will make uh, others in the audience's uh, hearts flutter a little bit, which is the area of big data. Uh, I know that there are several people from the business school here who think a lot about business analytics. You mentioned a little bit about big data. Um, I'm interested in that piece, but also how what your business is doing thinks about not just the future of big data, but also the flip side of that, which is the cybersecurity question. Um, how, how do you? Well, I mean, on my side, uh, quite frankly, uh, I have very little to do with it in that it, it is a point of worry, first of all. Uh, we are in the events that happened you know, yesterday with this terrorist. It is absolutely a point of worry. I mean, our network is not that resilient. Not just people ask me, Hussein, the governor of Virginia was in our data center and asked me, what are you doing about security? Uh, what is going on with what if someone comes with a truck and goes into your data center? And I said, look, this is really not the weak link here. The weak link is on your side. And he said, what do you mean by that? This was Governor McDonald. And I said, look, if you find a good fiber map and you know where the cross where the connections are, you have a gallon of gasoline and a lighter, and you pour a gallon in three different locations in Northern Virginia, you can take down a good part of the internet. You put it in the uh, duck bank and you light it. You could take down with three gallons of water a good part of the internet. So it is extremely scary. What we need to do is to have more government help and to be able to build diverse pathways. And the only solution is diversity, is to build much more diverse pathways. And so, and the switching technology exists, so when it um, doesn't, the data doesn't go one way, it can just simply go another way. And to get rid of those weak points. On the cyber side, that is more of a software technology that I'm less familiar with. Okay. Uh, but so then there, there, there's another question that I think is interesting that often comes to, to the world of, of data centers. I, I think I met you right after this article by James Glantz in the New York Times was written. And the reason I remembered is I, 
I thought I made this terrible faux pas because I didn't completely understand sort of what your business was and I sort of cited this thing and you said, oh my goodness, that guy called me and, uh, and actually I got a great education from it. But I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about what the issues are with power and how the power usage actually offsets a huge amount of other stuff that was going on before the internet. And maybe you can take us through that. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, James Glantz called me and um, he wanted to get a tour of the data center. I immediately knew that he wanted to write a sensationalized article um, about Greenpeace, hug the tree, what data centers are doing to the world. And you know, my wife was a, a scholar who had taught me that, look, you should at least show him your side, and that way, maybe he'll write a fairer article. Um, so I went and toured him the data center, showed him what we do, how efficient it is, what the efficiencies are. And I explained to him that, look, you 30 years ago were printing a newspaper, you're chopping down a tree, you're logging it down the river, you're getting the tree to the mill, it gets crushed, you make pulp, you add chemicals, you roll it with steam and electricity into rollers, you add ink you, to it, you print it, you roll it again with electricity. Um, it, it comes out into these diesel trucks to get distributed. A very bad sounding car goes to your home and throws it at your house. <laughs> and then you have to get rid of it as trash. All that is energy on one side. On the other side, we'll use some energy in a data center and you can read it on your tablet. Okay, it's not a zero sum game, but which side do you think he uses more energy? Well, I can tell you, Dahlia, he didn't take my, he didn't show my side of it. <laughs> my wife is sitting out front. He did not portray any of our side of it, but that's where it's at. And so I think the internet is saving the way we use energy, but it's not zero. Uh, we are all, and what I think he also failed to realize is that all of our tenants, at least in our data centers, they're very wary of the cost. They'll try to minimize, all of them have a stock price. All of them are trading at some huge multiple. If they save a dollar, their stock price may go up by $20. So they'll want to save that dollar if they can save it, if they're trading at a 20 multiple. So they'll want to save that dollar. It's not that they're wasting their energy money. Now, there are obviously government data centers that could be more efficient. But for the majority of the big tech companies, they're operating already on super efficient models. It's both a good lesson for what we're doing about sustainability and where it's going, but it's also a good lesson for uh, the question of, of, of how you deal with these kinds of issues, and it's always a challenge. Well, I think I'll continue to listen to my wife and still do the right thing. <laughs> um, I, I think we might have time for one question from the, one or two questions from the audience. Is, is there anybody who, who has any thoughts before we close? Anything you want to raise? Yeah? No? OK. Oh, please, sir, in the back. Go ahead and yell out. I'll, I'll repeat your question. I'm Andrew Hughes in the business school here, uh, uh, international business major in my junior year. I'm sort of curious, um, from the investment strategy uh, perspective, what it's like um, in, uh, in the international markets, particularly in the emerging markets. Is the demand uh, pretty high there? And um, what's the risks like by either going over there to invest in those or building up new ones and uh, trying to create a, a sector in that market? Um, you know, I've traveled all over the world to do this. Uh, there are a number of things that one needs to think about. And it's not just power. Like, for example, 
I did go to Bahrain. The government offered me two cents a kilowatt power. But soon I realized that the only fiber optic line outside Bahrain, this was five years ago, is owned by a company called Reliance uh, that's controlled by two brothers. So the risk was, in that area, building a data center, a couple of hundred million dollars, and then realizing you've got a toll booth right outside your building. As you try and raise rents, they can raise connectivity prices because there's a monopoly right outside. In some of the other uh, third world countries, or even emerging countries, the, there are big opportunities, everyone except China, in that there are big opportunities, but not many paying end customers. A lot of the services are running for, for free. So I feel that for, uh, there are software opportunities, but for data centers on my business, it's still a little immature because there's not gonna be that much. If you wanna build a small data center, I'm sure it's gonna be successful. But a very large data center, um, I don't believe yet there are paying customers. China is a whole different game. Been to China five times probably in the last 18 months. Their largest internet companies are as large as we are. They are desperate for large data centers. Currently, all their data centers are being going through essentially the phone companies. The three, mob, uh, the three phone companies control the data centers. The challenge there is how do you partner up with one of the Chinese phone companies to be able to get access to all three, and how do you know that long term they're gonna treat you right with connectivity? That's really the risk there. Uh, but the demand is absolutely there. I mean, um, 10 cents has a $50 billion market cap. I mean, th those companies are as big as Facebook and the demand is absolutely there. It's just someone has to figure out a creative way of solving all the solutions. And the REIT may not be the best uh, financial structure for it in that um, there are tax leakage and REITs when they go outside the US that haven't been solved. So one of the things we were, for example, thinking of, if we did it over there, you would do it with the sovereign wealth fund as your joint venture partner. Also, not to put all the REITs capital at risk, where they put in, we put in 25% of the capital, they put in 75. We bring our, uh, our infrastructure and technology and then we get a return on their invested capital as well. But having said that, we haven't done it yet. <laughs> Sir, last question. I have a quick question for you. Um, sort of, you know, measure in real estate investment trust is the uh, utilization rate of uh, square feet. You mentioned that that's not a fair metric for your data centers, and I'm curious <coughs> what the utilization rate is for available kilowatt if you think it is ever possible that we can overfill uh, sort of the data centers uh, that you're talking about, the, the demand that's out there for data revenue? I think the, your, your question, I think, on the demand side really leads to say, is our demand for processing power and storage going to grow faster than Moore's law? That's really your question. And so far, every year the indication is that it has. Has the speed of the internet gonna stop or slow down growing? That's the question you're asking in another way. And I don't think it's gonna slow down. I think that in a 10 chapter book, we're only in chapter three. And so, I'm not sure, does that answer your question? Well, it's not the 100, because also don't forget, each tenant will lease maybe 10, 10 megawatts, but they will use eight megawatts of it within that space because they have spikes of demand and they don't want to go much over. But when that's done, they'll have to lease a second 10 megawatts, then a third 10 megawatts, then a fourth. 
a company like Rackspace is growing at 30% per annum. So if they've leased 10 megawatts from us, in two years, they'll need an additional six, unless the internet stops, slows down in growth. Hussein, thank you so much. It's, uh, you, it's just such an honor to have thank you here. Thank you, Dean. Guthrie. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, we'd like to present you with this plaque that commemorates the, the Robert Maxson Lecture, the 14th uh, in this. And uh, it's just it's such an honor to have alums like you and to have you give us your time. Well, so thank you so much. We also have uh, two sweatshirts, one of which I'm sure is for, for your daughter who's yes. here in the audience. I don't know if it'll be the right size, but... Uh, we'll, well, she'll grow into it. <laughs> she'll grow into it and eventually come to GW, yeah. I hope. So. Well, uh, Dean Guthrie, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. You know, um, as a student here, it's always a dream to, to be able to make, a, make the right calls and eventually end up on this stage. So thank you. Thank I'm you. I'm proud to be here. Um, as a final word, I, I would be, be remiss if I just didn't say thank you all of the people who help make events like this happen. We not only have students and faculty who are in the room, uh, we also have uh, the Vice President for Research, Leo Chalupa, who's here, and John Forer, who's the Director of, of the Institute of Corporate Responsibility. Uh, we have Elizabeth Mitchell and the development staff that are all here. And we cannot do the kinds of work that we do in putting together events like this without the, the help of all of those constituencies. Uh, we are so thankful to have all of you here, uh, so thankful for all of the work that goes into these things, and most of all, so thankful for, to you, uh, Hussein. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good night.